Hi, Bradley. Hi, Julie. So, uh, to all in the audience, a very warm welcome uh, to this, which is actually the last uh, in our first series of LinkedIn Live. So, um, to those of you who've been following us all the way through, thank you. Um, and to those who are joining perhaps for the first time, uh, an especially warm welcome. And uh, to all of you, uh, we're ending on a high note. Um, you're in for a treat because we've got um, our uh, Chief Commercial Officer, Bradley Riss, um, who um, I'll let him I'll let him introduce himself a little bit in a second. But I should just say that we are very grateful to him for giving us some time with his vocal cords because they have been profoundly exercised in the last week. I think he's been on every podcast, live stream, webinar, fireside chat you can think of. Um, so thank you, Bradley. Hopefully we can have a bit of fun with this. Um, I will also say just before I let you introduce yourself that um, we did a little poll of our audience, uh, which was fun. Um, and what we saw is that we have a, a really interesting crowd amongst you. Um, we've got CFOs from merchants, we've got investors, uh, people interested in fintech and people who are just kind of maybe lay people who are interested in payments and why wouldn't you be? Um, so that means that uh, there is no such thing as a stupid question. There's just a lot of interesting angles. So please do put your questions into the chat box and um, and we'll we'll address them. We'd love to. Um, so before we start, Bradley, maybe if you could just tell for those who don't know a bit about you and your interesting experience and background. Sure thing. Um, I fell into the payment space accidentally about 11 years ago. It wasn't the industry then that it is today. It was a very lucky trip. Uh, <laughs> I guess I landed on my feet ultimately, but it gave me the opportunity to work with some of the world's largest merchants as they sought to expand their payments capabilities globally. So I have a lot of experience of, uh, again, working very much hand in hand with some of the biggest players there. Anyone in the audience today, I'm pretty sure that the guys I've worked with have handled transactions of yours, be they the largest streaming companies, social networks, what have you. Um, started off in San Francisco, had five years in Asia Pacific based in Singapore, uh, in the UK as well. So I like to think I should be able to share experiences on a fairly global, globalized view. Um, I guess just to reemphasize Judy's point, these are much more interesting when it's interactive and people listening actually have their questions or their interest areas answered. So please do follow through and uh, anything you put in the chat, we'll try to get around to and I'm happy to take on pretty much any sort of question you can come up with. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bradley. Um, so just while people are thinking of their questions, I, I think we can maybe get started with one that I, I've sort of been thinking about myself uh, in the last week or so. Uh, I know, uh, I think um, bro broadly, this uh, session is on customer experience. I would also say uh, to anybody watching, I think we're happy to do a bit of off topic Thursday if there's something beyond experience that, um, that you'd like to ask Bradley, take the opportunity, don't hold back. But I think on the sort of point of uh, customer experience at the checkout, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about it. We're not a B2C company, but we are, as I think you've said yourself, the special source um, behind some of that, you know, um, that interface at the, at the checkout and that experience. But nobody goes to the checkout for an experience. I think that's kind of well understood. So a case in point is that you were recently quoted talking about the distracted shopper um, and how to kind of um how to harness them when they are so very distracted and i think particularly they are so when they're shopping online so just to kind of quote you back at yourself uh from the, the article in payment source where you said uh, payments is a vehicle to access customers how do you access customers when they walk into a store and are on a smartphone and i guess even more complicated when your store is also on that very competitive screen space the smartphone so um I guess what what I'd love to do, maybe the journalist who uh, quoted you didn't have uh, time or space in, the, in their article, uh, is just to unpick what you mean, what the context of that is, and, and what, what you mean by access to the customer at the checkout. Yeah, sure. Um, it'd be probably easier to say it was a misquote and move on, but no, it's, uh, it's, it's, something, it's something I believe in, right? So ultimately, what is payments? Well, it's different depending on the circumstance. Uh, often you don't want the payment to be visible in any way, shape or form. But what I meant by that quote was there's a there's a convergence that's happening gradually, um, but it's been happening for a, a fair old time now. The card industry, for people who don't know, is, is referred to as CNP traditionally, card not present and card present. 
The reason it was called card not present versus online or digital was because that terminology existed before the internet. This was actually meant to refer to things like what's called moto transactions, mail order, telephone order, where the card is not present, but someone at the call center would actually be entering details manually if you were signing up for your, I don't know, subscription. This could have been like old school catalog subscriptions back in the 90s, for example. Obviously, that's evolved a lot since. But nowadays, really, if you're if you're on the merchant side, especially, you probably need to have a much more holistic view of how customers are interacting with your brand. They're not just reading from that catalog they would order in the 90s. They're not just walking into a store. They are accessing you whenever they want to through whatever medium they choose to. Um, obviously, mobile phones are the thing people think of first and foremost. Um, but even within mobiles, there's innovation taking place. You know, am I accessing it via your web browser? Am I accessing it via your dedicated app? Um, or am I my Tesla, my IoT device, effectively doing my shopping as it's self-driving me on my way home? I mean, increasingly, it's about understanding where your customers are going to be interacting with you and trying to cultivate an experience around that. I think one of the more recent uh, developments, it's, it's actually flown quite under the radar, considering, I think, the impact this will have. Um, but similar to how WeChat Pay in China is both a messaging app, a marketplace, and a payment service, uh, Google quite recently, they didn't call it Google Spot, even though that is what it's called in India, I believe. Um, they piloted this in India. It's been live for quite a while, so you can find a lot of information about it. They then launched, I believe, in Singapore next, and I believe there probably are plans to take this global very quickly. But effectively, this is now using a single app on your phone to collate multiple merchant apps. So again, is this now a new channel and ecosystem that you would need to interact with? Yeah, very, very possibly. Um, what's the value for the customer? Well, you know, do I want to download every app under the sun? No. But if I open my Google app and I'm in a Costa Coffee, a Starbucks, or what have you, is it great to have a kind of an in-app native experience without having to have another app added to my 500 already that are on my phone? Yeah. So you're starting to see, as I said, like the constant evolution. And I think that's what I meant by this, is really just keeping your finger on the pulse of these, not paradigm shifting changes, but these gradual evolutionary steps that allow you to be at the forefront of these new emerging channels and really to be able to meet the customer where they want to interact with you. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, um, uh, well, you mentioned your own uh, APAC experience. I guess a lot of this has come out of that region. I was speaking to some of our folks on the ground uh, over there in Singapore who were basically saying, even if you've got like, a, I don't know, a religious lifestyle manual, um, it's, it's. I mean, they were refer referring to one specifically. It's, uh, it's now an app and it now has payments embedded everything is embedded payments and that is just table stakes if you want to operate in that part of the world. To what extent are you seeing the same being the case where you are on the West Coast and, and how far do you think that will um, carry over to the West in general? Sure, so I'll do a quick shout out to the Monetary Authority of Singapore, who I'm sure are not listening, but they're an excellent regulator. I mean, one of the reasons you see so much innovation in Singapore, I mean, Singapore's an amazing testbed market, right? It has effectively, a dual lingual population which covers English and, and Mandarin, which is fantastic. You're talking about the addressable market you have if you've mastered those two languages, but it's obviously well, five and a half ish million people on an island, it's very self contained. There are no sort of delivery challenges if you're trying to launch a physical good product, but you can really use it kind of as a test bed. Um, incredibly, you know, astute, uh, well educated, digitally enabled uh, population, uh, very wealthy as well. So it's not even a bad sort of domestic market to have. Um, but that's, I think, one of the reasons, a combination of all of these um, all of these factors playing into one another. And I think that's also the other thing. When you look at innovation, where it's coming from, it's rarely about one genius pushing it forward. It's normally a collective effort that, again, has very heavy ties into things like compliance and regulation, which maybe aren't that sexy, but are necessary enablers and validators, I think, of new business models as they emerge. As it pertains to the West Coast US, the US actually kind of got stuck in a bit of a in a bit of a hole when it came to payments because they had the first mover disadvantage. So what absolutely was an advantage for a while, the reason like when you're going to, uh, to a retailer here, I will still be asked today during COVID to pick up their pen that they have sitting and sign. That's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You know, contactless has existed when I was working as a waiter back at Pizza Express when I was 18 years old. You know, that's a, a long time ago now. You know, and even then we were starting to do things like chip and pin at least. Um, so, you know, the evolution of contactless, often it's quite hard to move past the legacy infrastructure you have. Obviously, point of sale is a bit of a different beast because you have the devices and things like that. And addressing the previous points around convergence, 
nowadays when everyone has a, a smartphone, an iPad or an iPhone, you've got to start asking questions about what a device actually adds at this point. And again, this is the increasing convergence you have in terms of what's the ideal user experience you're offering. Obviously, COVID-related, health-related contact lists seems pretty much a no-brainer, and it's great to obviously see that rolling out now in the US. But it's sort of a testament to my previous point about being stuck with the technology you have for that life cycle is that we're only now seeing it roll out in the US. Um, that said, of course, this is still America. Um, again, shout out to US and the companies which have arisen here. There is a reason why a large proportion of the world's most innovative companies have been born within a 50 mile radius of where I'm sitting right now in San Francisco. Um, that sort of culture of innovation increasingly takes things forward. But again, it's always case by case, right? So what are the local market conditions? And equally, how are the regulators enabling them? And on the other side, what's actually the customer drive? Um, you could argue that the US probably has less payment innovation. Payment options, I think, is certainly true because everyone's so familiar with cards and cards actually work really well. Uh, in markets like Indonesia, for example, where you have 70% of the country is unbanked still or roughly in that nature, obviously, you know, you can't employ the same sort of standards. So in some ways, necessity then is the mother of invention and you find that payment mechanisms are put in place which help to, I guess, get around some of the more core macro elements such as an unbanked population. The final thing I'll say is, uh, again, credit to India. Uh, I think uh, UPI, the Unified Payments Interface, is a really good example of how you can actually learn from, you can learn from, I guess, attempts elsewhere. They weren't the first to attempt kind of an open banking initiative, but they definitely did a really good implementation of it. But at the same time, they also weren't encumbered by having this legacy architecture or legacy technology, especially as it comes to physical devices in place. So in some ways, they were able to leapfrog and move ahead to the next phase of payments without being burdened by the past. Yeah, that's interesting. It makes me think of, um, I think uh, it was yesterday, Benedict Evans was quoted in the FT um, talking about uh, investments in the payments opportunity, um, you could think of it as a um, uh, as a small tax on the future of the internet, which is the future of the economy. It, uh, that sort of suggests a belief that uh, digital payments will become increasingly just ubiquitous wherever and however we're talking about it. It's inevitable. I mean, if we're looking at you know drivers, you have to go macro to start with. Like, is there is this a broadband enabled country? Is actually a really key element. Nowadays, you almost take that for granted. It doesn't matter. I'll go back to, to Indonesia as an example. It almost doesn't matter what Indonesian island I would be on. I would still have three G on my phone. So I think nowadays, you know, we're moving in sort of steps where there are certain elements which get taken for granted. Um, but there are definitely more supporting factors that play into it. And obviously, any sort of new technological innovation, the world is becoming increasingly connected, uh, enables this. But again, it also comes back to that point. Um, I can't believe much I'm talking about regulators this week, but, uh, but it, they, you need them in some ways to enable. PSD2 in Europe, there's a framework in place and consistent standards which banks are mandated to adhere to. That level of standardization and consistency allows for a really good framework to actually build innovation. Um, if you look at what someone like Plaid did in the US, um, you know, they pretty much had to go individually to every single bank. So that's, yeah, good for them. They obviously did a lot of legwork there. But in Europe, in, in theory at least, it should be easier to roll out open banking initiatives uh, based on the fact that there is now this framework which has been encouraged to provide not just, you know, innovation on the banking sector, but equally competition to the car scheme. Yeah. Thank you, Bradley. Um, I've just seen, uh, we do have a question, um, so that's great. Uh, thank you, Suleiman. Um, so this is one actually, Bradley, from somebody, uh, Suleiman Smoo, who says he's uh, interested in joining us at checkout.com. Uh, oh. And uh, he just wanted to ask um, what we at checkout.com need to do uh, to pass our competitors like Stripe and Adam. That's a good question. Um, I, I hope you have an interview lined up and uh, hopefully you can uh, repeat my answer and hopefully it's the right answer. Um, the, the, I mean, Stripe and I don't have a lot of respect for. I'll, I'll just preface it with that. Um, to, to take a step away from the question, and this is again, if I'm, if I'm saying the obvious with people who know payments very well, I apologize. But if you don't, and that's most people, then kind of understanding what the payments value chain is first and foremost may help understand our positioning and that actually add in a Stripe positioning within the sector as well. Typically, a merchant connects into a gateway. 
And a gateway effectively is an aggregator of multiple merchants who may connect into one or multiple acquiring banks. The acquiring bank themselves is using a processing platform to interface with Visa and MasterCard. And Visa and MasterCard, in turn, interface and communicate with your issuing bank. That's your bank who gave you your card. You can also throw in fraud platforms and an additional bit of fun. But in the traditional kind of model of payments, you potentially, in between you know, a merchant's website, be it Amazon, Netflix, Facebook, whoever, and your bank, there are a whole bunch of companies and different platforms and technologies which are effectively in the transaction's way, is how I'll view it. So the transaction goes to the gateway, to a risk platform for a pre-auth decision, back to the gateway, to the acquiring bank, and the acquiring bank's processing platform more, um, more accurately, who then communicates with Visa MasterCard, who then communicates with the issuing bank, and then the transaction goes down all the way through that same chain, doing a post-auth check with the fraud platform to the gateway to the merchant, who then hopefully receives something like authorized as a code. Uh, they may not. There's actually hundreds of things that the issuing banks can send back that may mean that the transactions fail for different reasons. So again, taking a little bit of a history lesson to payments here, that model wasn't disrupted until, and again, credit where it's due, Agile were the first to do this. They collapsed that four-party model into a single state solution. Stripe were the second to do it. And the last company to do it, the most recent company to do it, the company who's built on the latest technology to do it, so this is our, how we start to then differentiate ourselves, to be completely blunt, is Checkout. Um, they say imitation is a great compliment. We don't necessarily have to be the ones who create this shift. We just have to be the best at doing it. And I think that if you're looking at you know, the secret source that exists within payments, a lot of it pertains to what I alluded to there around issuer responses. It's around data. There's a vast amount of transaction data sent in the authorization request and returned. Now, in that older model, again, bear in mind that the processing platform used by a bank may well be 30 years old as well, not even kidding. You know, they don't really have the capabilities, the technical standards, and they certainly at the time weren't people that I don't think viewed payments in this way. You won't necessarily be collecting data that you think is irrelevant. So by the time it gets back to the merchant, a data set may be up to 90% diluted. And again, if you see 10% of the data, you can't make very accurate decisions on that. Now, more importantly, what are you making decisions about? You're making decisions about why did my transaction fail and how can I potentially recover it? So you're focused on conversion rate optimization. And on the flip side of that, you're saying, how do I empower my machine learning models that my fraud system relies on to accurately detect fraud patterns as they emerge? And that side too. So basically, if you're able to harvest data and leverage it properly, you're able to boost sales and you're able to reduce fraud. It's a great trade-off. Now, we have the architecture that enables us to do that because we see the end-to-end -end journey of the transaction. I think one of the advantages we have, and I'll use that phrase again, we have second mover advantage in this space, is that a lot of the best technologies, the things that we were able to base a lot of our systems on, they just weren't available in 2006 or 2009. So again, I think that technology moves on very quickly, Moore's law or whatever we want to call it. Um, but again, just being kind of the most recent entrant into this space, adopting what is now, I think, accepted as the, the optimal payment model in terms of the, the transaction routing, we just have a, a more recent version. It's like having your, you know, your Audi A4 from 2001 compared to today. It was cool in 2001. It still is kind of cool now in a retro way, but obviously things have moved on a bit since then. Thanks, Bradley. And hopefully that was um, a, a good answer for you, Suleiman. Um, I would just say thank you for all the uh, the cheerleading in the, in the chat. It's nice um, to hear people um, thanking Bradley for his uh, great insights. There's a question for you, Bradley, uh, an interesting one. Um, eager to know checkouts view on crypto. That is a rabbit hole of a question, isn't it? Um, checkouts view or my view, I guess those two are probably aligned relatively closely. I think that we're very comfortable being on 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 the forefront of things. Um, I think you know crypto is it's funny, right? So Visa have a Visa crypto team now. If you talk to Visa a couple of years ago, the idea that they would even have T-shirts with Visa crypto on, and yes, I have one. They were kind enough to send me one. Um, it's kind of crazy, right? Uh, but this is the thing: it's legitimized. The legitimacy has, has clearly increased. I think to say that crypto is is a fad is now really really hard to justify as hedge funds and various other massive financial institutions are, are buying tons of it. Um, but as it relates to, I guess, our view, we have a comfort level in accepting the crypto as part of this overall ecosystem of commerce that exists in the digital world. And we're very happy to work alongside that. Now, I think the question, I'm going to interpret it this way anyway, relates to, do we plan on accepting things like cryptocurrency? Um, 
never say never. But today, the reality is, is that most transactions online, they're just not actually taking place in Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. Um, could they? They absolutely could in the future. There are definitely some limiting factors. As I said, you know, Visa MasterCard doesn't work badly. But I often view this through the lens of, you know, if we were to accept Bitcoin, what problem are we solving for that exists today? And that's actually quite hard to answer because payments is getting more streamlined, more optimized. And it's the same thing around, you know, why, do, why would you have a QR code in your restaurant if I can just tap my card and walk away? Well, you're probably not really solving a problem for a customer, are you? I mean, it's just as frictionless or actually more frictions to tap your card and take out your phone. So I think sometimes you need to view it through the customer lens and understand why for the end customer would it be appealing to make a transaction directly with Bitcoin. And of course, if you hold Bitcoin, then yeah, it may well be. It's like using anything from your bank balance. Um, but you know, let's peel back the onion at one level further here. When PayPal announced that they were allowing you know, cryptocurrencies on their wallets, let's be clear with this. They weren't saying that you can transact in cryptocurrencies. They were saying that you can buy and hold cryptocurrencies. And obviously, again, PayPal have their own, have their own view on this, I'm sure. But you know, it's really about holding them as an asset class, almost like a commodity, and then you can convert them back to a fiat currency to actually make a transaction. So again, you know, is cryptocurrency actually a currency or is it behaving a little bit more like a store of value? I think it's still the latter today. And that has a lot of value in itself, right? Um, but I don't view it yet as a necessity for merchants accepting payments digitally or online uh, in the vast majority of industries anyway, because uh, I don't think necessarily there's a problem that's yet being solved by it. I do think, and this is the final thing I'll say on this, especially as it relates to stable coins, USDC and things like that, there's amazing applications for international remittances where things like the SWIFT network, it works. It's been around a long time though, right? And taking three days and costing $40 to send money over the world is not exactly what we would consider optimal. So I absolutely see applications for things like stable coins and improving international remittances. If I didn't answer the question, by the way, you can absolutely kind of add a follow on there. I don't see the questions or anything else that's been um, said. Brad, oh, there's so many questions coming in. I think I'll just mention someone's just said thanks. Now let me check my Bitcoin account to see if I if you have the uh, Elon effect or not. <laughs> so, um, there, there are actually a, a whole bunch of really good questions. Uh, maybe I'll uh, summarize them and you can uh, so you know what you've got. Uh, so there's um, a, a question about checkouts, fast paced growth. Uh, and what you think the um, big challenges will be in MENA specifically as we expand our footprint there. Then there's a question about orchestration. Um, so Cormac O'Reilly Smith has, um, has sort of mentioned uh, companies like Primer, Paydoc, Apex, and uh, GR4VY. Um, and I, there are some others too. So that's another question. And then um, and the, uh, another one I'll just kind of bundle in here if you've got time uh, is how the B2B space is actually responding to this kind of technology that we're talking about. Cool. Really good questions. Um, so, okay. <laughs> Reverse order, I guess, as I remember the B2B one most freshly. Um, B2B, it's funny because things like SaaS, right? The, the SaaS model that, that Benioff is widely credited, rightfully credited with, with, with inventing. Um, you know, how are, are smaller merchants, especially SMEs, and obviously, you know, even a small merchant may have multiple SaaS subscriptions for businesses. Effectively, why not run them as a card transaction if you have a corporate Amex? You know, that's what we're seeing a lot, of, a lot happening nowadays. And again, it comes down to friction. Um, I'm not saying that SaaS is optional, but some of the SaaS services that the company may choose to use it is almost like an impulse purchase. You think it's going to help you with your marketing analytics. You're not sure. But if you didn't buy it, your company doesn't collapse. So it still comes down to the same sort of buyer tendencies about, well, they're interested right now. They're on your website. Capture that transaction. And if you're saying you have to sign up and there's a purchase order, ah, come on, you know, that's really not helping in terms of going out to market. Uh, so I think that's kind of just the high level, I'll say, on, on the business side, especially in the, in the recurring space, especially understanding that SaaS is normally subscription-based. Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth there. Um, the other question was related to orchestration, I believe, as, as the companies mentioned, we're all kind of startups in the orchestration place. Um, to say we're ahead of the curve on this one, I, and we were, um, to say it was, uh, you know, foresight that brought us there, yeah, I'll give our team some credit for that. Um, we bought the category leader process out over a year ago, I think now, 
um, for that very reason. Orchestration is amazing in terms of where it fits into a, a life cycle journey that a merchant goes through. So let me explain very quickly what I mean by that. The zenith of the payments world, and I won't name merchants specifically, but the biggest merchants and the most, I guess, mature, uh, the ones who are optimizing their payments to the highest level have literally hundreds of people in their payments team internally. So they have data scientists, they have product managers, all apply to what we talked about previously, which is how do we better understand and leverage our data to improve performance. If you think that you're running a subscription business, you know, the customer lifetime value of being able to increase to auth rate by 1%, that first transaction is worth the hundreds of millions to the biggest companies in the world. So, I mean, it's a really tangible point here. Now, how do you get to that level? Um, I always call it kind of the Netflix level. Uh, I don't know if anyone from Netflix is listening, but they, I mean, this is a huge compliment. Their team is really, really good, um, but they really understand payments and how it works as well. But you're not going to get there kind of overnight, you know? So how do you almost kind of have the closest thing to, to kind of a, a really mature payments organization in a box? Well, when you're starting out, you may well go to one of the, you know, the specialists in the SME sector, like a Stripe or a Braintree. They're very good at, you know, helping merchants accept that first transaction. Then as you mature, you start to look for slightly more in-depth tools that you can use for your business. Um, so you may add redundancy for having a second provider, but then you realize that there's this level of optimization, which requires a lot of analytics in real time. And that's where orchestration comes in. So I'm very bullish on orchestration as being a really key part of that segment of merchants who are getting, you know, probably around, I always consider like the $50 million rate per, uh, per annum. That's sort of where optimizing with multiple providers becomes almost a necessity and there's huge value add by doing so. So having orchestration as a layer there allows merchants to really educate themselves and really run their own sort of A-B testing on their providers. You shouldn't commit to a provider, they should earn your business. That's what I fundamentally believe and it's how we go to market. We don't mandate that you give us this much volume or that there. It's a case of us earning it based on our performance. And that's where orchestration can really help shine a light on who's performing well. And the first question was, sorry, I forget. And the first one was specifically on, uh, as we expand our footprint in MENA, what you anticipate uh, we'll be sort of tackling as challenges. Yeah, so the Middle East is a market, and, and North Africa as well is a market I haven't worked in or lived in directly, but I spent enough time there and helping merchants set up there that I have some opinions. Um, it's a very interesting sort of customer demographic in terms of how quickly how quickly it's growing, right? So you've got this very young demographic, a very sort of mobile enable demographic, um, there's sort of little anecdotes I can share, like uh, somewhere like Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, it's a very iOS dominated market. Everyone has iPhones, basically. However, there's also mandates around things like strong customer authentication. So things like Apple Pay are an amazing tool in Saudi Arabia because you get to tick the strong customer authentication box and at the same time have a really frictionless checkout. Your alternative is to go through you know, the old 3D secure model, where there definitely will be a challenge and you're breaking up the transaction process. So again, it's kind of understanding from a macro level, broadband enabled, after the population, can afford iPhones, iOS dominant, how does that segue with how I go and meet my customer? Well, offer Apple Pay is a, you know, a really short answer for that. There's also a local card, Mada, that actually links via Apple Pay as well. A um, little bit of a shameless plug for checkout, we're the only provider in the world who can actually offer Mada, the most issued card in Saudi, on Apple Pay. So again, you really have to dig deep on these sort of emerging markets uh, to understand how you should optimize your payments. It's not necessarily a kind of more is more game. Uh, do you offer cards? Yes. You know, but how are you offering them? Are you linking them to the channel or the actual mechanism like a, a pass-through wallet that enables the best checkout experience as well? But obviously the demographics of these markets, Africa really especially as well, I mean, it's really exciting. I think at some level, payments is driven by population size inevitably. And obviously, you know, the African population is growing so, so quickly that inevitably you're going to see a lot more innovation coming. And you've already got some great payment companies who are operating there. I should also maybe say just another a small plug. Uh, when we talk about MENA, we talk about MENA P now because we are also uh, in Pakistan. And um, we've been doing a little bit of work uh, on that region on the research side. Definitely a very interesting space to be in as well. Um, I We've hit the half hour point um, and we've had lots of really interesting questions. So thank you for those. Um, hopefully you found it interesting by the looks of your comments. Oh, someone's just said also, don't forget uh, Sanat and KNAP, KNAP Middle East market. Um, so uh, we've obviously, we've got uh, some good feedback here. Uh, if you've got more questions in due course, um, 
check out our check out our um, blog page, uh, and there's a space there where you can send us questions. We'll get them through to Bradley or whomever else, um, and and feedback to you. Um, I've also um, got to mention that uh, we have an ebook uh, on some of these topics available, which you uh, there should be a link in the uh, box for you to follow. Um, and anyone who tuned in with a special interest in uh, conversion at the checkout in particular, um, we've partnered with ID ICD recently, and uh, there's also, I think, a link for you to follow there. Um, and okay, just before we drop off, Bradley, I, I know we've taken a lot of your time. There is one more question. Um, I feel like I'd like to give it to you if, if you don't mind. Um, how do you democratize trust between buyers and merchants where the schemes have little penetration? Oof. <laughs> That's a fun one to finish on. How do you democratize trust and what was it, sorry? Uh, trust between buyers and merchants where the schemes have little penetration. That's uh, the, the wording of the question. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna again interpret that in my way. So where the schemes have little penetration, I'm gonna interpret as where there's very few Visa and MasterCards issued, for example, or Amexes or Union Pays or what have you. Um, trust is often built up in that way with things like 3D secure and strong customer authentication. 3DS2, it's it's not maybe a super exciting topic, but it is definitely going to help improve fraud rates and conversion rates and customer experience. I think it's actually going to help on all fronts. So asking it in the way of non-card base is, is quite a quite an intelligent way. That said, things like PST2, the framework is around all payments, not card payments. It's just the fact that things like Ideal in the Netherlands, for example, inherently has that challenge that means that it is SCA compliant by nature. So a lot of these payment methods, because they also have sort of an external link, uh, very often when you're choosing to pay with not a Visa MasterCard, you're actually redirected away from the website you're on. So I think the trust is actually quite instilled there because it's not necessarily between you and the merchant, it's between you and your bank. If I'm directed away from an online banking transaction, do I trust, okay, in the Netherlands, ABN Amro and my Dutch account? Yeah, I'm using my online banking facilities to log in. So normally you find that your trust with your bank, who may have had you for customers a decade, is going to probably override any lack of trust you may have in a merchant who is the first time you visited their website. By no means always the case, there's a lot of fraud, there's a lot of spear fiddling, you, know, you need to be careful with the consumer as well. But I think the fact that you're redirected very often to an external, an external site where obviously they know you because you've left that payment method, maybe you're an Alipay user and you have your account login details, I think that in itself instills quite a lot of confidence. I think cards have always carried more risk, which is why things like 3DS2 uh, is specifically applied to the card acquiring world and is not as, as necessary uh, for local payment methods where there is often a two-step process in place already. Brilliant. Thanks, Bradley. You've uh, given us a lot there and, and there's a lot of thanks and love coming through on the comments. So uh, I think that's a, a great way to end. And um, thank you all guys for your questions as well. Um, wishing everyone a really good rest of their day. Thanks everyone.